Uh, welcome to this workshop on uh, risk sensitive uh, decision making. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Margaret Chapman, who will be presenting a brief history and some recent developments on risk sensitive autonomous systems from the perspective of optimal control. Margaret holds a bachelor's and master's degree for, in mechanical engineering from Stanford University, as well as a PhD in electrical engineering and computer science from the University of California, Berkeley. Margaret is currently an assistant professor with the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Toronto, which she joined in July of 2020. Her research focuses on risk averse and stochastic, stochastic control theory, which with emphasis on safety analysis and its applications in healthcare, as well as sustainable cities. I've had the great pleasure of collaborating with Margaret for more than five years. As a civil engineer, I'm an outsider to the field of control, and I've always valued Margaret's ability to clearly explain complex ideas and ground them in real world use cases, which is why I'm sure she'll do a great job kicking off this workshop with a brief history of how people have thought about risk and its applications to real world control systems. Thank you, Kevin, for that kind uh, introduction. Um, so can everyone hear me? Do you just want to full screen your presentation? Oh, yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, does this work? Yes. Okay. Uh, and then if I can here, yeah, um, so can everyone hear me in the audience? Okay, great. How about in the Zoom? And folks, is there any way to know if? Uh... Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Great. Okay. Um. Okay. So, uh, so thank you everyone, um, for attending my talk. I. Uh, so I'd like to present, um, so this talk is based on joint work that was um, recently accepted by the Journal of Artificial Intelligence with my master's student, one of them, um, Yuang Wang. And I'm pleased to be here today. Um, so I'd just like to give a brief introduction of what I work on. So I'm interested in uh, problems, the intersection of risk concept, uh, risk, safety, and uncertainty. Uh, their mathematical foundations and also applications to um, environmental and human health. And so just a brief overview of my research activities and research vision. Um, so I'm, hmm, this doesn't, this is, uh, the pointer doesn't quite work, but um, so basically I'm inspired by practical problems in um, environmental and human health in particular water, stormwater um, management, and also cancer treatment. And then inspired by those problems, I've formulated theoretical studies that involve um, about risk analysis and also synthesis of risk averse policies. And, um, and so I'm gonna highlight two of these works today um, later on in the talk, but I'm also going to present a broader overview of uh, risk, the analysis of risk, the connections, um, to autonomous systems from an, an historical perspective. Okay, so what is risk? So there are different definitions, and these may, may be interpreted qualitatively or quantitatively based on application-specific needs. And a couple of definitions from Miriam Webster are the possibility of loss or injury, an entity that creates or suggests a hazard, and another definition from the International Organization for Standardiz Standardization, which is a, a global federation of national standards bodies, is that risk is the effect of uncertainty on objectives. And so the purpose of this talk is to examine and present the core connections between the analysis of risk and the control of semi-autonomous systems. I say semi-autonomous because Almost all of the systems that I will present have some autonomous element, but also some non-autonomous element. So perhaps there's a human in the loop. Okay, so um, in the first part of the talk, I'll present uh, the two mainstream paradigms for managing systems under uncertainty, and then I'll motivate the risk averse paradigm. I'll then present three concepts that are helpful for quantifying risk with some examples. I'll present, uh, I'll introduce risk functional and also uh, associated optimal control problems. I'll discuss adaptability and scalability challenges, and then I'll propose some future directions. Okay, 
So there are two mainstream paradigms for quantifying and managing the potential consequences that may arise from a system's behavior. So there's the robust paradigm, which is also called worst case, and there's a stochastic paradigm, which also may be called risk neutral. And so disturbances are modeled in different ways in different paradigms. So the robust paradigm models disturbances typically as non-stochastic bounded and adversarial inputs. And in the stochastic paradigm, disturbances are modeled as random variables. Um, these may be adversarial, such as in a distributionally robust setting, or they can be non-adversarial. In the robust paradigm, quantify safety or performance, assuming the worst circumstances, which depend on um, the constraints and the assumptions about your problem. So your disturbance bounds, for example. And while the stochastic paradigm quantifies safety of performance and probability or on average. And so here I've highlighted just some example papers from different communities from machine learning, robust control, stochastic control, and also formal verification over the past, I guess now 50 years. Okay. So, um, but an issue with assessing safety or performance on average alone is that disturbances with diverse characteristics can have the same expectations. So these are uh, six distributions. They all have the same expectation, uh, but they're quite different. So here in these two, we have that the spread of the distribution around the mean is different, but these are both symmetric. These two distributions have different shapes. Well, these, um, but they're still symmetric, but these two distributions on, uh, these la last two distributions are asymmetric. And if the outcomes, represent potential costs incurred by a system, then we may prefer some of these distributions over others, even though they all have the same expectation. Okay, so this is one motivation for risk averse control theory, that the expectation is not designed to assess rare harmful outcomes. Another motivation is that assuming bounded disturbances excludes common noise models, such as Gaussian noise. Also, systems often require an awareness of rare harmful outcomes, but without being too cautious. And also risk averse systems theory has potentially broad applications. So for example, civil and environmental infrastructure under weather uncertainty and um, hard to predict climate trends, population growth and medical applications under patient to patient variability. Every patient is unique and so should be treated as uniquely, but there's not a lot of data to represent that one person and also human-robot interaction and many other examples. Okay, so what does risk-averse mean? So colloquially, if you were to go on Wikipedia and look up risk-averse, it might say something like this, that risk-averse describes people or algorithms that prefer outcomes with reduced uncertainty. But this definition is, is not quite specific to systems. So I'm going to present a definition that um, I propose that uh, emphasizes systems. Okay, so for a given system, we're going to assume that there's a random variable Z whose realizations describe the consequences that may arise from the system's behavior. And so in this talk, risk averse describes people or algorithms that prefer distributions for Z with specific characteristics, where the characteristics reflect a desire to reduce harm. And so the term to quantify risk means to summarize numerically the potential consequences of the system's behavior. Okay, so there are three concepts that are helpful for quantifying risk. Um, or these are, I believe, the three main concepts. One is the probabilities of harmful events. Two are uh, temporal logic specifications, which I'm going to denote by TL. And then three is risk functionals of random variables. And um, I'm going to be focusing mostly on risk functionals, so the third concept, but I'd like to introduce a bit the first two concepts as well. And so just for those of you who are unfamiliar, um, temporal logic at a high level, it is quite deep, but at a high level, it's a mathematical language for describing relationships between different events in time and specifications that are expressed in temporal logic can be deterministic or um, probabilistic. And the terms risk functionals and risk measures are synonyms. Okay, so let's just look at one example, a network of autonomous and human drivers. 
so let's consider um, a random variable to be the distance between an autonomous car and a human driven car at time t. So perhaps we prefer larger realizations because we like the space to be the auton between the autonomous uh, and the human driven car to be larger within some uh, range to, um, to, allow, to uh, avoid collisions. And we also denote by lowercase d the smallest allowable. And so in this example, um, so a probability of a harmful event might be the probability that there is a collision. So this can be quantified using um, the event, the probability that ZT is less than or equal to, to lowercase z. An example of a temporal logic specification is that ZT is greater than or equal to Z for every time T with probability one. This is a very a simple example. And an example of a risk functional could be the average value of ZT plus the, uh, the squared of ZT minus the desired distance. Do you think my, my computer is making that? Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. So let's look at another example. Um, this is a cancer cell population. Uh, so in this example, um, Z is the ratio between the number of healthy cells and the desired number of healthy cells. Let's say the end of a treatment cycle. And again, here we're preferring larger realizations. We would like the number of healthy cells to be close to the desired number of healthy cells. And here you'd actually look at concentrations. You wouldn't look at quantities necessarily. And here, lowercase z is the smallest allowable ratio, which is estimated from a doctor's expertise. So, for example, z is um, lowercase z is determined by, um, uh, for example, if if uh, based on the patient's um, side effects under the drug. So, a tier of distribution for capital Z for our ratio between healthy cells and desired number uh, concentration of healthy cells can be estimated from a dynamical model when you vary parameter estimates because every patient is going to have different parameters. So an example of a probability of a harmful event is the probability that capital Z, our, our ratio is too small. So for example, if the treatment is too toxic, drug resistance develops, et cetera. An example of a um, temporal logic specification is that for every cycle after the fifth cycle, um, our ratio is sufficiently large with sufficiently high probability. And an example of a risk functional is our average value of Z in the 1% worst cases. Okay. And this is just another example, um, a hydroelectric dam. And here, capital Z um, could be the volume of water that discharges into the emergency spillway due to a storm. And um, a distribution for Z can be estimated using a dynamical model for the dam and also historical precipitation data. An example of a risk functional here may be the average value of the maximum of capital Z minus an allowable discharge level based on local regulations, comma zero. Okay. Um, so next, in the next section, which will be um, the next 10 minutes or so, I'm going to present some examples of risk functionals and also optimal control problems. So I'll present um, some examples and also the standard form of a risk averse optimal control problem. I'll present the pros and cons of the most classical, uh, the, the, I would say the most common type of risk averse optimal control, which is based on exponential utility. And then I'll present two additional methods. So, um, and in this talk, we're going, we're going to focus on risk functional. So what is a risk functional? So risk functional is a map, which I'm going to denote by rho from a space of random variables, which I'll denote by, um, by bold Z to um, a subset of the extended real line. And so we're going to assume that smaller realizations of our random variable are preferred. So we're interested in minimizing an objective function. And so I'd just like to emphasize that I'm using the term risk functional because what it does is it emphasizes that the domain of rho is a space of functions. And this is not to confuse it with the concept of a probability measure where the domain of a probability measure is a space of measurable sets. So that's why I'm making the distinction here. Okay. So risk functionals can quantify heavy tail distributions or higher order moments of random variables. And so here I show, um, so it's a little bit cut off, 
But here I'm showing a random variable Z. Uh, I'm showing a random variable capital Z. And I'm assuming that it has a density. And I'm drawing its density. Um, I'm drawing its density here. And so um, there, these are some examples of different ways to quantify dispersion from the mean. Um, so this is called semi upper semi deviation. Um, here we have the standard deviation and the um, expected value of the absolute value of Z minus the uh, mean, it falls in the middle. And I'm also showing a quantity called the value at risk, which is also the um, left side one minus alpha quantile of the distribution of your random variable. And um, I'm showing an example where alpha is chosen to be sufficiently small. The area here is alpha, but it needs to be sufficiently small so that when we take the expected value plus the variance, so we take the expected value plus the variance, it's still less than, than the value at risk. Right? And in this setting, the conditional value at risk is equivalent to the um, expectation of the realizations of the above the value at risk. So that's in, in this particular setting. How much time do I do I have? When did we start? Sorry, I'm I have 20 minutes. Okay. Yeah, okay, that, that's good. All right. Um okay. So these are some some examples. So we have different ways to quantify dispersion from the mean. And then we have some quantile base with functionals too. And some other examples, which are a little harder to depict uh, on the on the uh, for a density, is a compositional risk functional, which at a high level looks like this. There's um, it's expressed as a composition of different risk functionals, and um, compositional risk functionals are also called uh, nested or recursive risk functionals. It depends on which um, papers you look at. Uh, and another common example are the um, expected utility model, and that also has different forms. Sometimes it's just expressed as an expectation of a function H, where H is a sufficiently regular utility function. And sometimes it's also expressed in terms of the inverse of H of the expectation of H. And so again, the form depends on the different papers, but basically these are trying to quantify the subjective preferences of a given user through a, a chosen utility function H. Okay. Uh, let's see. Okay, so the standard form of a risk averse optimal control problem is um, again here, I'm assuming that um that Z is a random variable in which smaller realizations are preferred. So that's why I'm minimizing here. And so, um, so we, here we have a risk averse objective where we're minimizing over a class of control policies. And the policy class that you choose depends on the problem at hand. So for example, if you're looking at a partially observable system, then your policies are only going to be functions of your information up to time, um, up to the current, uh, your functions of your observable information up to the current time. If you have a um, fully observable system, then your policies are going to be perhaps functions of the state and actions up to the current time. Or you might also um, encode information in other variables as well. And, um, so uh, so we have an enthemum. So this is a minimization over a policy class of a risk averse objective. So this, um, in words, this would be the risk of Z subject to uh, your system dynamics where explicit equations may not be available. Again, it depends on your application at hand. And also subject to possibly risk averse constraints. Um, we're here, I'm denoting rho i uh, pi is a risk functional that's associated with a random variable z i, and the constraint says that the, the risk of when measured using rho i um, of capital z i is in an interval k i. And so this is a very general form, and this is usually not tractable in this form. And um, uh, 
And most, um, so I'm also writing here pi um, in the superscript because typically the distribution, the probability distribution of Z and ZI, it depends on the control policy that you're using. It also depends on how you initialize your trajectory. So for example, your initial state or your distribution, your assumed distribution for your initial state. And um, so this is the most general form. It's tr intractable. Uh, for the most part, and most research in this area concerns um, exponential utility, which is a one type of risk functional, and that's where your utility function um, is an exponential, um, it's, it's a weighted exponential. And so most work is in, uh, uses this risk functional, and here I show some example papers starting from 1972 uh, and then up to pretty much present day. Um, and I, I just like to highlight that. Um, so uh, there's some really interesting work that came out in 2020 that involves exponential utility and mean field games. Um, and some of the most famous work has been done by Whittle, Peter Whittle, 1980s, 1990s, um, where he studied the, um, uh, the problem of minimizing exponential utility subject to a linear system additive Gaussian noise, and also um, quadratic false. Okay, so let's look at a classical example. Um, and so this is the example I, I was referring to where we minimize over a class of deterministic um, Markov policies here. I'm restricting the policy space to deterministic Markov. Um, and we're minimizing the exponential utility of a, um, at a risk averse level theta, which is less than zero. Um, subject to known dynamics, um, constraints on the control, and conditionally independent disturbances. And this has typically the interpretation under appropriate conditions um, as a mean variance um, approximation. Here, this is, uh, this is cut off, but this is my symbol for, um, for variance. Okay, so some pros and cons of this classical approach are um, you can solve it using a dynamic program on the state space. Uh, you can use an exponential utility, a functional to represent a user's subjective preferences, which is also common for any approach that involves um, a uh, minimizing an expected utility. Um, exponential utility also provides a mean variance approximation under appropriate conditions. But there's some challenges because um, we it's pretty hard. To, it's not quite possible to um, always produce a mean variance trade-off by making your, uh, your, your parameter theta more negative, which we'll see. It's also hard to provide a precise quantitative interpretation of exponential utility and also its parameter uh, theta. And I'll just write a brief example. So this is just a simple example um, to illustrate how different values of theta can affect the optimal distribution of Z. And we consider a very simple um, system, a thermostatic regulator, the state is in R. We're looking at a sum of costs um, where the stage cost represents a distance between a state and desired temperature range. We're assuming a, um, a, a skewed distribution that doesn't depend on the state or control. Okay, so, um, so I'm gonna thank Kevin for this example. He developed it. And, um, and so here, what happens is that depending on your initial condition, you can sometimes get the desired trade-off between mean and variance. So here, um, our, as our variance goes, uh, as our uh, mean goes down, our variance goes up, which is what we'd like. We'd like to see this trade-off. But uh, for some initial conditions, you don't get the trade-off in any meaningful way. And in particular, is you make theta more and more negative. So theta is more and more risk averse. Actually, both your expectation and your variance increase, which is not what we want. And then this is just another example with a different uh, cost uh, cost function. Okay, so um, so this is just a summary of the different types of risk functional. So mean dispersion, expected utility, we just saw an example of expected utility, compositional and quantile based. I'll just present brief literature on these two aspects next. And so compositional risk functionals, these have been growing in popularity in recent years. One is because for the most part, they admit a dynamic programming algorithm on the state space. You don't need to enlarge the state space to develop a, such an algorithm. 
Um, there's some interesting work by Amadi from 2021. He does some um, POM DPs with finite state, finite action spaces. I think the paper is still under review, but it's a really nice paper uh, where they uh, look at, uh, have the objective in terms of composition of risk functionals and then the constraints also in, a com in terms of the composition of risk functionals. So quantile based functions, uh, risk functionals have also been growing in popularity. Most common is C bar. Um, but uh, these have been extended to a class called spectral risk functionals, which are mixtures of the C bar across the levels of alpha. Um, that was done by Bowerly and Bonner in 2021. Um, really interesting work by Lars uh, Lindemann on signal temporal logic, and also really interesting recent work um, by Barbosa and others um, where they're applying C bar to robot motion planning. There's been a lot of work recently with C bar motion planning, but I just wanted to highlight this one paper from 2021. Okay, so um, I just like to present um, how much time do I have? Like uh, seventy. Okay. Um, yeah, so I just like to present. I'll just present one of these methods, and then I'd like to um, uh, uh, discuss scalability and adaptability challenges. So, um, so basically, um, if you don't use compositional risk functionals or you don't use exponential utility, uh, you can't. Uh, define a dynamic programming recursion on your state space. You have to do something else. And so these are two other ways that people can solve um, risk uh, averse problems in certain contexts. One is to reduce uh, the problem to a family of non standard risk neutral problems and then solve uh, that family using another technique, such as state space augmentation or, or something else. And then um, and then there's also uh, dynamic programming on the state space for compositional risk functional. Okay, so um, oops, oh, ah, sorry. Uh, okay, um, so this is an example problem from some of my recent work um, where we aim to minimize the C bar of a maximum random variable Z. So Z is, is a, represents a random maximum distance between the state trajectory and a desired operating region. Most work in, on Markov decision processes has involved cumulative costs. I focus on maximum cost here. Um, both are important, um, where a maximum cost you use when you care about the short-term extent of a constraint violation, which um, is important for stormwater management and also in other applications as well. So we're studying this problem because it provides a safety criteria on for a stochastic system that's informed by both the probability and severity of the potential consequences of the system's behavior. In contrast, most methods, they either just consider probabilities, which don't take into account severity, um, which is basically saying that, okay, does a bad, bad event happen with some probability, but we also care about how bad the event happens. I mean, how, how, how severe it is. So if you get COVID, how bad are your symptoms? So the yeah, severity matters. Um, and, um, and so here the objective function here may be interpreted as the average value of your random variable Z in some percentage of your worst cases when your initial state is X and your policy is um, high. Okay. Uh, okay. So this is the example reduction technique. So for some um, risk functionals, you can use the definition of the risk functional, and then you can locate a non-standard problem within, within your original risk averse problem. So here we use the um, definition of C bar, and then we exchange the order of the enzyme to then um, uncover the non-standard risk neutral problem. And then we then solve this problem uh, using a state space augmentation technique where we define an extra state that summarizes the maximum cost up to the current time. And I'm going to skip those details in the interest of time. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna skip that. Um, okay, so uh, just a brief note about dynamic programming for compositional risk functionals. So another high level idea where if you have a, where if you define your optimum uh, value function as an enzymum, kind of in a recursive way where you're looking at, um, where you're, where you, you uh, are minimizing a composition of risk functionals. The key idea is that under some conditions, you basically can derive a dynamic programming recursion 
um, where you replace your conditional expectation by a risk functional. Okay, so I'm gonna keep going. I'm running a little bit out of time. Um, so I'm just gonna highlight the key ideas here. So, so basically, um, Many problem solving approaches are based on reformulating a risk neutral algorithm. We've seen two examples. And the challenge is that these methods inherit the scalability and adaptability challenges of the original risk neutral algorithm. Okay. Um, so, some uh, adaptability challenges are that your disturbances, um, you need a representative family of disturbances, those are hard to estimate. Scalability challenges include that um, dynamic programming doesn't apply to high dimensional state spaces, and we'd like to derive value or policy approximations, but we need to understand the conditions under which those approximations are well justified. Okay. And so recently, I um, we uh, developed some work using extreme value theory, which is a branch of statistics that to model the upper tail of a probability distribution. One benefit of this approach is that you don't need um, dynamic programming. It works for small numbers of samples, um, but you are only estimating the risk. You're not optimizing the risk. This is work with um, my two masters uh, students, Ewing and um, Evan, that was just accepted by uh, IEEE Control Systems Letter. Okay. Um, and the key idea here is that we're able to estimate the risk using small numbers of samples, which is quite interesting because we're dealing with rare events. And usually when you deal with rare events, you need a large number of samples. But if you use a technique like extreme value theory, you can actually get away with small numbers of samples. Okay. All right, so just to conclude, um, I'd like to wrap up with some proposed future directions. Um, so one is the use of risk functionals and data samples to adapt estimates of system models or safe regions. There's really interesting work by Coast and Ruzinski from 2021. And basically, they use um, compositional risk functionals using um, uh, to help uh, protect against modeling um, value function approximation errors. Uh, their results make sense um, because the types of risk functionals that they're using, called coherent risk functionals, those actually have a they are distributionally robust expectations. So it's just some really interesting work that they that they just published. Um, we need further studies about um, model free methods from a non asymptotic viewpoint. There's very little on this. Um, there was one paper from 2021 that uh, does a non asymptotic analysis of a risk averse Q learning algorithm, but this is the only paper I found. And just to um, conclude, um, we need more studies that combine aspects of both model free and model based methods um, and we need different variations of such methods to accommodate uh, diverse application domains. Okay, so um, so thank you everyone for listening to my talk. I'd just like to thank my research group, uh, my collaborators um, and my funding sources. And um, thank you very much for, for listening. These are a lot of references. <laughs> Uh, we have time questions. Yeah. Yeah. So the key difference is that most um um so most estimators are basically based on variations of sample averages. Like if you kind of it's like they're plug-in estimators, you kind of just replace the mean with a sum of your sample. Uh, but the problem with that is that it doesn't deal with stuff in the tail. But what extreme value theory does is it provides a model for your tail. And um, it's applicable to a large range of districts, like many distributions, Gumbel, Brache, Burr, um, I don't know, there's a big list, I forget. Um, normal, uh, log normal, gamma, like, and yes, none of your random variable may, may not have any of those distributions, but it's quite rich. It's, it's, it's a quite rich class of distribution. So the key idea is if you think about like a, a distribution function, it's um, increasing or non-decreasing right continuous. And in the upper tail, like the upper part, that's hard to estimate. And what sample, uh, what the types of uh, standard statistical estimators that you mentioned, that's kind of like you're just using estimates from a couple of data points. So it's like really sparse. 
But what extreme value theory does is it fills that out. It provides a model for that upper tail. So the results that we get are really, I mean, they, they're not surprising at all because we're basically taking ideas from a different domain and we're saying, okay, let's put a, use a model for the tail. And wow, we get better than if we just do, you know, grab a couple of samples. Um, but the thing is, it's not used a lot at all in uh, control theory. Um, extreme value theory is used a lot in um, hydrology, like for uh, flooding level prediction, um, if you for earthquake, uh, but it's not used for system theory uh, as much. Um, so yeah, so it's really interesting. Uh, there's a great book by uh, Dahan um, from 2006 that uh, provides a great introduction to it. In our paper, it's on archive, um, and uh, the final version should be in IEEE like in a day or so. We provide um, like basically a summary of a part of that theory that is applicable to systems in like very condensed uh, way as well. But it's it's super interesting. But there's been very very little work uh, about extreme value theory with autonomous systems applications. Following up, on the yeah. uh, following up on the extreme value theory question, so my understanding of extreme value theory is that it's kind of like an asymptotic result in the sense that, um, yeah, only in the limit as you get infinite samples do you kind of converge to the, the correct distribution uh, that you're trying to model. So I'm curious, um, are you aware of any like finite sample results in terms of how, yeah, like how accurate the distribution that you end up modeling actually is relative to the ground truth? Yeah, no. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, so well, I have a student who's working on um, like that, <laughs> but uh, no, we haven't we haven't found uh, found anything. Most um, concentration bounds are used are at least in our field are they apply it's a direct application of the Hobson inequality, where people assume bounded random variables and then they apply the same trick to then drive the concentration bound. Um, but in extreme value theory, it's more complicated, and so you have to do some more things. So we're not um, we're not there yet. Sounds good. Uh, hi, thank you for your talk. Um, I had a question about the um, sort of those plots you showed for the exponential uh, functional sort of yeah the uh, really the trade offs between yeah. yeah. Um, right, so you show that uh, under certain initial conditions, they can sort of, you don't get what you want. Um, maybe you could just reiterate for me, like, is a takeaway here that sort of this particular functional just is sort of not applicable in certain situations? And is that why you sort of introduce things like CVAR to try and correct for this? Yeah, so the key takeaway here is that spectrum utility at pretty much the past like 50 years has been like the state of the art for risk risk averse control. And typically it's argued as, oh, it's because it's a tractable way to minimize the linear combination of mean and variance, and then we get this nice trade-off. Um, but this shows that that's really not a good, <laughs> not a great thing to do. But I think that um but exponent utility always has the interpretation of being a utility function for a particular user. So that is not violated at all. Um, these examples just show that if you want to trade off mean and variance, sometimes you get a trade off that isn't even a trade off at all. But what I'm not showing here is actually if you narrow down, this is around the risk, this is like nearly risk neutral, like very close to zero. We have plots in our paper um, that I couldn't show because the slide is not big enough. But if you narrow down in these points, you actually do get a trade off. Oh, but it's I just see. like really tiny, you know, it's like, it's it's just negligible in, in practice. So if you zoom in on zero around here, you're going to get that trade off. But then the question is, well, does that, is that, is that even meaningful for your application? So it's like a, a localness kind of? Yeah, thing. yeah, because the approximation is only based on, um, well, the, the idea is that the theoretical conditions that you need to drive the approximation, you can just ignore those. But if you look at most papers, People just say it's a mean brain approximation. But what we're saying is that, well, the theoretical conditions that you need to drive that approximation actually have practical significance. And if you're not careful, then you basically lose your, um, you, you lose 
your mean variance trade-off, which is exactly what you want when you use utility functions if you're studying it from a, I guess, non-decision theoretic point of view. Cool, thank you. I think this is to accept all the questions now, but there is one question from the chat. So Haruki is asking um, whether risk should be a constraint or an objective. On the one hand, risk constraints may seem to make more sense than risk obje objectives for addressing safety critical problems. On the other hand, risk constraints may be solution methods make may make solutions method complicated. Do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I think it really depends on your application. Um, it, it depends on the problem that you're trying to solve. Um, I, there's, there's been a lot of work where you, like say, minimize an expectation subject to risk constraint that might, um, you know, that might be completely suitable for your application, or you might be interested in um, the more general form, which is where you minimize a risk um, averse objective subject to constraint. So it just depends on your application that you care about. There's no like one right answer. Then maybe for the other questions, you can just ask Margaret later in the coffee. Yeah, break. I'll be here all day. So um, yeah, happy to happy to answer any questions. And it's been an honor to be here. So thank you so much for asking me to come. I think it's really helpful to know the time. <laughs>